Hi, I'm Whitney Espick, the CEO of the MIT Alumni Association, and I hope you enjoy this digital production created for alumni and friends like you. The question is, given this enormous challenge of climate change that we're facing, can we learn how to be different kinds of human beings? And of course, changing human behavior is very, very hard, as we all know, right? And our idea of how to live our lives, what uh, what we mean by success, what we mean by failure, who's going to succeed, who's going to fail. I mean, these are calculations that we perhaps do tacitly every single day. And changing the preference list there is hard. And so can technology help? Can we make it easy for people to learn from each other how to be um, better problem solvers in this era of climate change? That's sort of climate X's uh, premise. Um, we're starting small, um, but um, one of the things that we have explored a lot is new media forms. So uh, I bet many people watching or listening to this um, conversation have taken a MOOC, a massive online course on edX or Coursera or um, one of the other uh, online uh, providers. And I bet many of you have registered for a course and not finished it. Um, in fact, I bet you that's probably a majority of the people on this panel. <laughs> and so, the, so what we said is instead of making it th that hard, if, if it's so hard to get people to take a full course online, maybe we make it easy by um, creating media forms that are easier to consume and therefore easier to share with your friends and easier to experiment on. So, um, so we are looking at short podcasts, videos, um, short texts. Uh, both Quentin and Adam have been featured actually on our uh, podcasts and uh, interviews. And what we are finding is that kind of quick turnaround at least gets people into the stream. I mean, I don't think you can solve climate change with podcasts. I wish we could, but <laughs> we're not going to be able to do that. But I think that it's a great tool for bringing people into a problem solving space. And especially in areas like Boston, uh, Cambridge in particular, uh, there's a combination of citizen activism, which is very knowledge driven, very science driven. If you look at the uh, Gas Leaks Alliance, that's a great example of a uh, citizen driven alliance that's nevertheless very um, um, sciencey, right? To me, those are the kinds of coalitions and problem solving activities that are collective uh, that need to happen in greater and greater amounts. So if Climate X can make that happen and provide a technology um, hub. So we, we are not trusting technology out of people. We don't see ourselves as creating a widget that everybody uses. We, we think of ourselves as a technology provider that gets out of the way as quickly as possible. Right, and so um, part of uh, the challenge here then is how to design technologies that make it easy for people to work with other people and not be confused by the technology. Um, as, as anyone using Zoom or Skype knows, the hard problem is often getting it to work. And so we don't want that hard problem. We want the easy problem of working with each other. <laughs> so, um, so that's our idea. Our idea is that learning to change, learning human behaviors at every single scale from individual to town, to state, to country, to the world is part of our um, collective problem solving path as a species. And um, in the next season, which is our season three of our podcast, we'll be exploring in fact this precise idea as to how um, different scales of collective action are necessary for addressing climate change. And um, I think I'll leave it with that. Uh, if you want more information, go to climatex.mit.edu. That's the easiest way to find out more about what we're doing. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, that was really interesting. Um, and we'll just, we'll go on to the next speaker and then um, each, each person will kind of have a little bit of time to talk and then we'll um, we'll come in with some questions and hopefully um, we'll have some questions from the audience too. So go ahead and send in all your questions and we'll gather them and um, and we'll do that um, after we hear from the next couple of speakers. Um, so the next the next person up is Adam Haas. He's um, 
a um, master in city planning candidate at MIT for uh, 2018. Um, Adam, why don't you go ahead and give us a little introduction to yourself and your background and tell us what you're working on. Great. Thank you, Courtney. And Rajesh, thanks for referencing me in Climate X. My name is Adam. I am currently a Master of City Planning candidate. I will soon be an alumni and join the ranks of, of Quentin and Rajesh and Courtney on this panel. Um, my research really focuses on the intersection of climate change and equity. And my thesis research is what I'm going to present today, which is looking at how can those two things be combined within Massachusetts. And in addition to being here at MIT, I'm also a fellow with the Switzer Foundation and Environmental Entrepreneurs, E2, and both of those have given support for this research. So wanted to give them a shout out and uh, make sure that they know that I'm very grateful for that support. So I'm gonna get this screen share set up. Courtney, is this working properly? Uh, I do see the screen. So yeah, if you go to, um, if you, yep, that, that shows up, looks good. Wonderful. So again, this research is on equitable energy for Massachusetts and this big question, of how can climate policy reduce inequality? And that big question has been motivated from two big trends. These are two images taken from the Imagine Boston 2030 document, which is the master plan for Boston. On the left, you can see Boston's climate goals, which is a very ambitious reaching carbon neutrality by mid-century and reducing emissions by half by 2030 from their baseline of 2005. On the right is something that we don't usually talk about in climate policy, or at least I don't usually hear it referenced, which is inequality, particularly inequality along the racial wealth gap in Boston. This is from a study from the Boston Fed in 2014, and um, it's, it's striking to see the gross wealth inequality between white families where the median income is 24, 2000, sorry, $247,000 and the median income for black families is $8. And so my question is, can all of the investments that we're making within decarbonization, within clean energy, be used as a way to reduce inequality? So in terms of the decarbonization, the consensus among most policymakers is that we need to electrify everything. This graph from the Acadia Center shows that if we overnight could change all of our vehicles and all of our heating systems from the combustion fossil fuels that they currently use to electricity, we would cut emissions by half immediately in the Northeast. Once we add on additional renewable energy and get to 75% or 80% renewables, that gets us very, very close to where we need to be in terms of the overall emission goals for 2050. And what I've looked at more than transportation is heating. Heat pumps are a way to electrify and dramatically reduce emissions. So you look at the left of this graph, oil, propane, and natural gas all have fairly high emission levels for the heat that they produce. Given our current generation mix, if you switch to an air source heat pump, you would already be cutting your emissions in half, even from natural gas. If you go further into what the grid should be in 2030, if we're going to be on the path for deep decarbonization, then you're going to cut it even more. And so there's a lot of potential there if we can figure out how to switch out homes that are using particularly oil and propane in the short term and then later on natural gas, that will be the path to actually get to the deep decarbonization. Currently in Massachusetts, most of our homes are heated by utility natural gas. There's still a lot of homes that use petroleum products or electric resistance. The orange in this graph is showing renters and the blue is showing homeowners. And that's an important piece to consider when looking at equity. So for thinking about the immediate decarbonization goals, looking at petroleum products and particularly renters who use petroleum products, that's a very high area of emissions. Uh, and we could also support those renters by reducing their energy costs through transition to heat pumps. Likewise, electric resistance is a pretty simple transition to go from electric resistance heating, which is where you're just heating up wires for heat, to heat pumps. And that's another area that we should really focus on moving forward. 
But it's not just about energy savings. There's also consideration of where are people located? And Massachusetts has a great uh, program for environmental justice to designate three different types of communities, low income, minority, and English isolation. And they've mapped out where all of those communities are in the state. So it's possible to imagine actually targeting electrification efforts for the places that need it most. And there's also the economic dimension of jobs. The broad Massachusetts clean energy economy is thriving. There's 110,000 jobs, more than 68% of workers earn more than $50,000 per year. And we've been doing pretty great since we passed climate policy here in 2008 in growing the green economy. But unfortunately, it's not equitable. If you look at the workforce, only 25% of jobs are held by women, only 12% are held by minorities. Those are far lower than the parity of those populations at the state level in terms of population. And so we can do a much better job of making sure that the benefits of clean energy jobs are shared. So to sum all of this up, what I see as a solution is what I've been calling equitable electrification. If we were able to infuse equity within our climate action plans, we would be able to increase savings, particularly if we were targeting along the environmental justice criteria and expanded the low income dimension to also think about middle income uh, renters and homeowners, uh, because it's not just the lowest income that can benefit from energy savings. Jobs could use community benefits agreements to require local hiring in order to make sure that more people from communities are benefiting from the jobs. And for wealth, if we had goals for hiring a certain percentage of minority owned businesses or women owned businesses, we can make sure that there's a greater equitable distribution of the profits that are made from the clean energy transition. And to wrap up, I'll just share that there are three exciting opportunities potentially to actually enact this in the very short term. Massachusetts is in the process of making its 2030 Global Warming Solutions Act targets which will be the goal for which we work over the next decade to reduce emissions. And this could be incorporated into that. Boston is going through a similar planning process, carbon-free Boston, to get to carbon neutrality. And finally, MassSave, which is our state's energy efficiency program, is going through its three-year planning program right now. And so incorporating equity and electrification into that plan would be a great way to accelerate this. Thanks everybody for listening and looking forward to hearing your questions. Great, thanks so much, Adam. Um, and um, we'll move on to Quentin. I know that you, um, Quentin has to leave a little early, so I want you to just go ahead and um, introduce yourself and tell us um, about what you're doing and, and what you're up to. I'll let you start. Thanks, uh, Quentin Zondervan. I graduated with a master's degree in electrical engineering and computer science in 1995 and had a very successful career in uh, software and as an entrepreneur but also was uh, always a climate activist at the same time and started a couple of nonprofits locally to try to address the issue. And last year decided to run for Cambridge City Council and I was elected. So I'm currently serving, I'm actually in City Hall at the moment. And we are definitely dealing head on with the issue of climate change and how that impacts our city. Um, including in all the ways that, that Adam and, and Rajesh have already uh, highlighted. And so what I want to do is give you a sense of what that's really like on the ground, you know, in the moment, what are we dealing with? So uh, five years ago, I helped lead an effort to get our building emissions down to zero. That was called net zero. We filed a zoning petition, which is a way for citizens to initiate a uh, change in the zoning laws. And that ultimately led to the adoption of the Net Zero Action Plan, which is a 25 year plan to get our building emissions to zero, uh, largely through electrification as Adam has, has pointed out, uh, and also including you know, changing our building standards and, and other ways to uh, really tackle that issue. So that's an important part of what we're working on right now. I'm actually uh, preparing to schedule a committee hearing to get an update on where we are. With, with our net zero action plan from our staff. Um, another aspect of climate change that I've been working on all along is adaptation, resilience. How do we prepare for the climate change that are happening? And so starting back in 2008, 
uh, as a citizen, I was advocating for this. And that led to the climate vulnerability study, which was completed last year for the city of Cambridge. And that really identifies very clearly where the major threats are that we face in Cambridge from climate change. And those are really centered around flooding and heat. And flooding is two different uh, aspects to that. One is precipitation flooding, so big rainstorms. And then the other one is sea level rise and storm surge, which can lead to uh, additional flooding during, say, a hurricane or a nor'easter. And, you know, in fact, we experienced that twice already this year in Boston with the nor'easter. So we're really up against that question right now. Okay, so if those are our vulnerabilities. What are we going to do about it? And the uh, citizens, which is Rajesh points out, are quite active in our city, have filed a zoning petition, which uh, just appeared on our agenda last Monday, that is proposing very specific changes to our zoning to protect us from, from flooding and heat. So, it, for example, would require that our buildings be raised above uh, certain flood levels. It would require a greater amount of green space uh, on the properties as they develop to help mitigate the urban heat island impact. So we are now entering into the, the difficult part, which is to have a conversation among our citizens around how we should uh, deal with this issue. And in particular, there's a very uh, real tension between trying to address some of the equity and justice issues that, that Adam highlights, particularly around affordable housing and addressing climate change. And, and the argument really starts to crystallize around, well, you know, if we add these requirements, then it makes it more expensive and difficult to build housing. So should we really be doing that? To which I respond, well, we shouldn't be putting people in harm's way either. So we need to find some balance there that we are all comfortable with that says we've done enough to protect our citizens so that we can actually build housing in these areas. Uh, and, and still keep them safe. So, so that's a live conversation we're having right now. So uh, happy to answer any questions and uh, happy to be here with you all. Thank you. Great, um, well, thank, thank you. Um, that was really interesting. And we have, um, we have had some questions come in um, and um, I'm just kind of looking through some of these um, there was one that that um, came in about um, um, about the idea of tackling climate change and whether that's a matter of um, educating the public um, or you know how much how much how much resources should we um, divert to tackle naysayers, people who are manufacturing doubt about climate change. This this kind of thing always comes up, um, and I was wondering. I know. Um, Rajesh had something to say about this, but I'm wondering if we could, um, you could say a little more um, um, in, in the conversation here about um, what what kind of education you think is needed um, to tackle climate change. Boy, that's a tough question. <laughs> um, I personally feel like the deniers are are have too much of an agenda to change. I mean, that's a very hard, I feel like the problem that Climate X generally and my, I, what I find most interesting personally is the people who agree that there is a problem, what can we do to make it easy for them to address it in the communities that they live in? Because I think that, frankly, there are co-benefits to everybody. So by seeing uh, cheaper energy rates or by seeing better housing stock coming into the market that is um, clearly better than what happened before, uh, even the deniers are more likely to find that this new world is a more exciting world. Okay. Yeah, if I can add into that a little bit, um, there, there's another kind of denial that's more subtle and, and also more addressable, which is the large number of people who are willing to consider that climate change is real, or maybe even have fully accepted that it is, but are not ready to make any changes to their lives as a result. 
and and so again, you know, we're we're dealing with that right now. So so I'm not talking to people who are saying, oh, climate change is not a thing, so we don't need to worry about it. I'm talking to people who are saying, yeah, climate change is real, but we can't make housing more expensive. So how do we address those people? And, and I think that's where education can really help because those people are open to counter arguments that convince them that, you know, putting sprinkler systems in buildings is also expensive, but we all agree to do it because you know, we mm -hmm. understand that fire is a real danger. Yeah, and, and building on, on that point from Quentin, I think there is not an appreciation for many people who acknowledge climate change at how much work we need to do to actually address the climate crisis. It, it's both, what does that mean from a personal level, like, like maybe it's a more expensive house, but it's the larger national or international expenditures that we need to make to really decarbonize and decarbonize quickly. And I think that pace and that scale is often not appreciated. And, and that is the more subtle form of denial that, that worries me because there's also a cost. If we don't do that bold action, then we're going to have a much costlier form of adaptation that we need to take later on. Okay, thanks. Um, we had a question from, from an alum um, and um, it, it actually get, gets at a couple of things that both Adam and Quentin uh, touched on um, especially, um, but you know, what are some, um, climate equity strategies for communities that are vulnerable to flooding um, and, um, sorry, <laughs> my screen moved, and heat related climate effects. Um, also, how can we help low income communities reduce their impact when they may not be able to afford home improvements such as weatherization? Um, this, this came up to me too, because I'm, I'm involved, I'm, I'm, I'm currently kind of trying to do some things through Mass Save. I'm a mm -hmm. homeowner, but you know, you're talking, you've talked about um, renters, and and that's a whole other that's a whole other issue too. So it seems like you know getting, make, making these things logistically work um, for low income people for renters. Um, how how can you talk about about that issue? Yeah, Quentin, do you want to go first on the um, adaptation side? Yeah, thanks. Um, you know, I, I look at this question of justice as we have to reframe the question. It's not how do we help people reduce their climate impact. It's how do we help undo some of the injustice that's been done to them? And as we do that, we do it in a way that is uh, congruent with adapting to climate change. So that means making funding available and actively going out to specific communities and saying, how can we refurbish this building so that it's more comfortable for people so that it lowers their energy costs and so that it's safe for them. So, so the, the burden should not be on them. Uh, one of the programs that I've been able to create is community solar. And what we were able to do there is say, how do we make the benefits of solar available to community members who don't own a house, who don't have a roof to put solar on, who don't have the financial means to do that. And what we were able to do is create solar arrays on other buildings and then sell that power to community members at a discount. So they're getting complete benefit and we're not asking them to reduce their impact. We're saying, here's what we've got for you. Yeah, I, I completely agree on that, on that framing. And I think the question of renters and low income really depends on the program design of our efficiency programs or any programs supporting solar, supporting air source heat pumps. The renter landlord dynamic can be very difficult if a landlord is not paying for the energy bills, but a landlord has to make approval for a building. I'm actually going through this for my building right now. I'm a renter in Cambridge and it's been really hard to get my landlord to call mass save and actually get the audit done and get those other pieces done. Um, so I think one thing is how do we incentivize landlords to act? Is, is it a portion of energy savings? Is it a bonus? That could be something that's done in the program design um, that could you know, create an incentive to counteract that split incentive problem. On the piece of low income, right now Mass Save has 10% of its funds set aside for low income households. And that is defined as if you are under 65% of the state median income, then you are low income and, and you can get everything done for free. 
Um, the challenge is that if you're above 65%, that if you're at 70%, you don't get that. And then you have to put a lot of money up front to be able to uh, be able to get a, get those same types of services. And so a question is, are there, are there financing mechanisms? Are there other ways that we could help those households that are more moderate income um, to also access this? And finally, how do we improve the, the education to let everybody know that this exists? There is a network called the Low Income Energy Access Network, LEAN, um, and they've been doing a lot of good, good community outreach and organizing, but I think there could be even more success if we were working directly with community organizations. Some friends of mine have been doing this in Dorchester with a group called Resonant Energy, um, where they've been working directly with community organizations, um, paying people stipends or having people get uh, incentives to be able to recruit their neighbors. And by going through the Common Square Association and other neighborhood associations, they've been able to dramatically increase uh, the number of households signing up for solar in this poor, predominantly African-American community. Um, so I think there are a lot more ways that MassSave and other Massachusetts programs could work with community groups to do that outreach. Great, thank you. Um, I just I'm going to I'm going to do one more question on on this sort of track because we we got a few questions coming in about um, since we're on the subject of buildings and efficiency and things like that there were some questions um, Quentin about the um, Cambridge you know what exactly the plan is to get um, buildings closer to zero emissions and um, uh, what's the cost of that and someone asked about um, you know, does that is that really just municipally owned buildings? Is that is that going to be all buildings in the city? Um, maybe you could just give a few more details about how how that actually works. Yeah, so it, it is for all all buildings in the city, um, but the municipality goes first. So we are currently in construction on a new elementary school, and our target is net zero for that school complex. And in terms of cost. There, there are some up, upfront costs to, to making that happen. So, you know, investing in geothermal wells, investing in solar panels. But of course, for a municipality, uh, we, can, we can outweight those paybacks, right? So we can say, well, this school is going to serve our community for the next 50 years or more. And so those energy savings that we're building in upfront, we're going to reap all those benefits for for those 50 years uh, and, and save ourselves money. So overall, it's actually not more expensive, it's cheaper. But in the private sector, that's a more difficult calculation because um, the developers who are building the building aren't necessarily the ones operating it for the long term. And so similar to the landlord-tenant split, there's a, there's a split incentive problem there. Um, so, you know, we're, we're looking at different policies that we need to implement over the next 25 years to get all the buildings down to zero. So we start with, you know, the building codes that are, that are going up and then we put additional requirements uh, on top of that as much as we can to increase the energy efficiency of, of large buildings that get built to make sure that they're ready for solar. So we, before we require them to have solar, we say, well, your, your building has to be ready to host solar because again, there's third parties that can provide that solution on top uh, without involving the, the original developers of the buildings. Right? But if, they, if the building's ready, then that precludes that option uh, down the road. We're also working with the universities and, and local biotechs on developing standards for biotech laboratories to be net zero. So again, that's an example where we don't necessarily know how to do it today, at least not in New England, but if we put our minds together and learn together, we can grow into a solution where we can have net zero laboratories in the future. And then as, as Adam has highlighted, uh, we, we do need to electrify. And so for example, we um, created a community choice aggregation program in Cambridge where uh, all of our basic service rate, rate payers are getting a higher percentage of their electricity from renewable sources. And that's again, an opportunity where over time we can expand that program 
and get more and more and more electricity from renewable sources as we continue to electrify at the same time. Uh, we're also working with the staff on uh, promoting electric vehicle uh, charging stations throughout our community as another way for people to, to start shifting. So, you know, the, the full uh, action plan is available on, online. If you, if you search Cambridge Tech Zero, you'll find it. Um, and it is complicated, but, but it's certainly all doable if we invest the time and in, in the effort. Great, thank you. Um... I also I have a question for Rajesh. Um, um, this is um, I was interested. So you know we've been talking about um, you know buildings, about heating technology, about uh, you know all these all these kinds of technological solutions that that people think about for climate change. Um, you're using technology in a different way. Um, so I wanted to know um, how you see the role of technology. You know beyond beyond you know these efficiency technologies we're so used to thinking about um, in energy. Um, what is the role of technology in addressing climate change? So, um, thanks, Courtney. I mean, I, I think of many of these problems strangely more as data problems rather than as hardware problems. So a great deal of efficiency, or especially if you want to reduce consumption or share resources, these are coordination problems where you, uh, if there was better data, and there, was, there were ways to link people to each other, so essentially social uh, community formation technologies, that would be a very different way of uh, addressing some of these challenges. So to give you an example, if you have community solar or if you have solar panels on every house, you may still want to coordinate, say, how businesses can buy solar from their neighbors who are not at home while uh, at night it could go the other way around, right? And so these are the kinds of, um, you could say, negotiations or um, coordination problems that technology can address where you're not necessarily creating new hardware, but you are solving the problem through software, so to speak. Okay. Um, that, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. These things are all connected and sometimes, you know, the, the ways that you access things and how they're distributed and how you, how you use them is, is just as important as having the technology. Um, I, I think there's a question about, um, you know, uh, the, this question about cities and states um, kind of having these programs um, versus um, top-down federal regulation. I think that since we're talking about cities, I think this is a good a good um, question is what because city cities have some uh, ability to do you know to take charge and to do things and to have initiatives, but there's a lot of um, you know there's a lot of control that states have. There's a lot of control that the federal government has. Um, so I'm wondering. Um, I guess I'm wondering what you know where cities can make an impact because th there's a lot uh, in the news about cities today, but they do have there are some limits to what they can do. Um, but, um, but maybe you can talk about um, how we should see the role of cities. Yeah, um, thanks, thanks for that question, Courtney. It's, it's been really exciting to see how many cities have stepped up with greater pledges of ambition since the Trump administration decided to pull out of Paris. I think that's been one of the more hopeful trends that have happened over the last year. Cities really are varied in their capability to address these things, both because of the differences in terms of resources. The city of New York or even the city of Cambridge has a lot more resources than, than many smaller cities or cities that don't have the same economic bases. And the second thing that's varied is the local regulatory context. Some cities have full control over the building codes. Some cities don't. In Massachusetts, you have to do a state building code. Um, there's certain things like the stretch code that each city can enact independently, which is like an above and beyond improved energy efficiency on top of the base code for the rest of the state. Um, but that, that again depends on the specific context. What I do think cities can do that the federal government and state governments usually aren't very good at doing is engage citizens and neighborhoods and people that are on the ground in actually doing 
collective work. Um, that can be like a community-based energy efficiency program, solar program, where a lot of neighbors are going solar together and they're supported by the city. Um, that can be in thinking about what is a collaborative street redesign that could feature more than bike lanes or perhaps um, electric charging vehicle station. And all of that work of, of planning the specific built environment that people experience at an everyday level, that, that's where the cities can effectively intervene. When it's things that are more related to incentives, like a renewable port portfolio standard or a carbon price, that's much harder for a city to do. Um, I would think really only New York and maybe Chicago or LA would, would have the scale to do something like that meaningfully. Um, but, but mostly that's going to be a, the state of the federal level. Okay, great. Um, um, let's see, I'm just seeing if we have um, some other questions. I know we have to wrap up in a minute. Um, I, um, I actually, um, I, I think um, I did have a question for Rajesh, which just was about um, a little more about um, who's, who's using the, the site, the Climate X site and kind of how, because we've talked about um, how, how climate change work can reach more people. And so I'm wondering, you know, how you think about expanding your reach and reaching people for the, you know, this educational component of climate change, how, how we can, how you can reach more audiences. So, and well, depending on how you think about it, it's the people who use our site tend to be people who are already pretty active on climate change. Uh, and so it tends to be somewhat of an insider crowd, which is not surprising, right? Uh, because we are not advertising in a major way, but we are beginning to talk to uh, other parts of MIT and you know, there might be a bigger portal in the works where there, we will do a very, make a very conscious effort to reach more uh, constituencies. Uh, but I think that if you grow organically, chances are that the people who are excited about climate are the ones who are gonna come to the site and engage. And we see those patterns both on the site itself, but also in the listener statistics on our podcast. Um, and uh, engagement on social media, it, it tends to I mean, we there are there, of course, be a few deniers, but that's a pretty small percentage. Um, and, and most of the engagement comes from people who feel like there's something really major happening, and we need to do something about it. Well, um, I think you're probably going to find more and more people feeling that way. So, um, <laughs> which, um, which, you know, will will expand the interest. Um, I so I think our our time is basically up here. Um, um, let me just um, thank you all for for showing up. I know Quentin had to leave a little early, um, but um, I want to thank you um, for being here and for giving us um, uh, telling us all about what you're up to. It's really exciting. Um, and on behalf of the um, Alumni Association, we want to thank uh, everyone out there for tuning in to this faculty forum online. Um, and we didn't get to all the questions um, submitted, but we are going to forward all of them to the panel um, to take a look at. And again, you can tweet about um, today's chat with the hashtag um, MIT Better World. Um, and if you have any follow up questions or feedback, you can send it to Alumni learn, alumni learn at mit.edu. So thanks again for watching and um, bye everybody, take care. Thanks, thanks Courtney you. for your fantastic effort coordinating this. You're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> really appreciate it Courtney. And thanks everybody for tuning in. I'm looking forward to reading all of the questions once they're emailed. Okay, thank you. Thanks for joining us. And for more information on how to connect with the MIT Alumni Association, please visit our website.